The revolution will be individualized. This is TK Coleman, and I got my brother Kamal with me. Kamal, how you doing this week, man? Pew, 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 pew. We changed the name of the show. We went from live stream to individualized because that's really what it's about. The revolution starts with one. Yeah, we've always said that, right? We, we've always said the revolution will be individualized. But originally, the show was in the studio. And when we smooth, when we switched everything over to live stream, we just said the revolution will be live stream, you know, as a kind of way of describing the change. But we feel like individualized will be a much more fitting title since that's what we're all about. Absolutely. And speaking of, the name of today's episode is Vanguard of the Revolution. And this is the first part. Let me tell you what inspired this. So we've done a couple of different episodes. One of them is called uh, An Inquiry into Radical Mass Movements. I encourage you to go check that out. And then a couple of weeks ago, we did one called Everything You've Been Taught About Malcolm X is Wrong. And we talked a lot about how Malcolm's ideas are, are kind of pigeonholed and, and, his, and, and he's sort of depicted in a certain way. But we talked about a lot of valuable things that could be learned from him about liberty and fighting for freedom. And so we received a comment that said, um, maybe you guys could do more deep dives into historical figures who have been contested or painted for history in the wrong light. And I think that would be something really cool to do we think it'll be really fun to do. And since in most circles where the, the political philosophy is, is voluntarism or libertarianism or where the economic philosophy is capitalism, you don't see a lot of conversation that references people that rejected those views in, 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 in a way that that acknowledges that they had lots of useful insights that can be employed. And so we think it could be kind of cool to do that. So this is called the Vanguard of the Revolution. And I wanna, I wanna give you the definition of the word Vanguard. Um, and this is taken from the Oxford Dictionary here. And the definition is a group of people leading the way in new developments or ideas, the experimental spirit of the modernist Vanguard, or the foremost part of an advancing army or naval force. And so to be a vanguard of the revolution is to be on the leading edge. And that's something that we're all about here, helping individuals be on the leading edge of liberty. What are the conversations that everyone isn't having? What are the things that everyone isn't doing? The people that tend to be revolutionaries, the people that tend to create change in society are people who don't just go along with what's socially acceptable, with what's popular, with what's already known, but they look for insights and strategy, strategies that tend to be a little counterintuitive. So the first part of this conversation I wanna have as kind of a setup for talking about um, uh, the vanguard of the revolution, I, I should also say that this title comes from a documentary about the Black Panthers called Vanguard of the Revolution. I encourage you all to watch it. It's a very interesting documentary. Usually when you watch material on the Black Panthers, you get um, things that are that are heavily biased in one direction. And this one was pretty cool because you had a number of people who were police officers at that time. You have people that are Black Panthers at that time. And you hear both sides being criticized internally. And so it's, it's a good model for the types of conversations that we want to have. But that's where the title comes from. But before we get into any of that, in our conversation about Malcolm X, one of the things we discussed was the optics of ideas and, and, and how there is a real distinction between the optics of an idea and the usefulness of an idea. The optics of an idea refers to uh, the reputations of the people who typically espouse the idea, or it refers to the image that is invoked in people's minds when they hear that idea. And the usefulness of an idea refers to what, can, what it can actually be used to create or construct. And there is almost always a gap between the optics of an idea and the usefulness of an idea. Sometimes there are good ideas that have bad optics. Sometimes there are bad ideas that have good optics. And more than we are often willing to acknowledge, people respond to ideas not based on the strength of the arguments that we use to defend them, but they respond to those ideas 
based on the optics they have? What are the reputations of people that have said similar things? Or what are the feelings that get evoked when you bring that up? And so, for instance, you think about something like socialism. Socialism has at its root the word social. And mm -hmm. that sounds really good. Or communism comes from the same root as commune or community. And that's really good. Most people that are socialists, most people that are communists, most people have not actually read books on this. They have not actually studied it. But the optics of it tend to be, hey, this is something for everybody, right? This is something to lift up all the people, right? And so the optics tend to be really good. You take something like capitalism, optics tend to be bad. The root of it is capital. And if we're, if we're, if we're comparing capital with, with community, with, with society, it seems like at the level of optics, one of those is already at a disadvantage, right? Because capital is all about stuff, whereas social is all about people. And so if you're going to have a debate or a discussion on something like capitalism or socialism, you need to go into that discussion understanding the optics of the ideas and how it affects the way people think. The reason I, I, I want to set this up by talking about that is because we're going to be discussing people who might have good optics and will critique some of their ideas. Or they may have bad optics and will say, hey, everybody, don't let the optics distract you from taking valuable lessons that we can all use to make our lives better. So I want to pause there as kind of like a setup. And uh, Kamal, you, you want to chime in on any of that? Yeah, I think a lot of the figures uh, that we want to talk about, you know, even starting with Malcolm X, I think what really drove and inspired that conversation is personally in my life, I've seen a lot of these people, well, as a member of the black community, I've seen a lot of these uh, folks as, as good people to look up to, people who stood for uh, black people and black culture and uh, defended them. But I think what's really interesting as kind of ob observing them and, and studying them and, you know, hearing about their legacy from other groups that aren't black, you know, hearing about their legacy uh, from the perspective of somebody who's white or somebody who's Asian, um, th the perspective is a lot different than than a person who is in the communities. And some of sometimes that is informed uh, by their own research and 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 knowledge that they've gained about that person, but a lot of times it's not that case. A lot of times um, people's per perception and people's you know, feelings about these certain figures are fueled by uh, propaganda that has been pushed and, and you know, narratives that might not really be true to the spirit of that person. I think, you know, there, there's something about individual, you know, policies and values and, and things that people really stand for and try to push that you can look at and and dissect and, and, and find out what's right about it and what's wrong about it. But then there's also a spirit that a person is really driven by and, and, and what their goals and and that I think informs how they approach that and how, uh, you know, they become an influential figure. It's so much about the spirit of their character and, and you know, the why behind what they're doing. And I think that's, that's just important for context. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to change, needs to change whether you're in agreement with some of their ideas, but I think getting the full picture allows you to better uh, interact with the ideas and allows you to, you know, take down the cloud of judgment that may be blocking you from interacting and learning something from these people. 100%, man. I, I think education is what happens in the space between the optics of an idea and its usefulness. I remember I had this Christian professor in college who told me that if you want to understand other religions, don't just read books written by Christians who used to practice those religions. Go find books that are written by people that still practice that religion, that believe that religion is good, and learn about that faith from the perspective of a current practitioner who's having a positive experience. Sometimes that frightens people because people are afraid, but wait a minute, I'm going to lose my beliefs if I study something that contradicts what I believe or that challenges what I believe. 
And what I say to that is first, if you lose your belief, chances are the basis for that belief was not very strong to begin with. If in order mm. to secure your beliefs, you have to avoid ever interacting with information that challenges those beliefs, then those beliefs are merely opinions based on superficial reasons or shallow emotions. Secondly, when you engage ideas that challenge you, even if you come out believing the same thing, you hold that belief with greater empathy, a greater sensitivity to how someone else could see it a different way, and that makes you a better communicator. And you hold that belief with a greater level of sophistication. Your capacity to communicate with people that think differently than you improves. Your capacity to get more out of your own beliefs improves. And so I have always maintained that one of the most important personal development practices is the whole idea of good game peeps all game. Be willing to <clears> learn <throat> from everyone. I always say, if you can't learn from someone that's imperfect, then how are you ever going to teach yourself anything? Because you are one of the objectionable people. Because one day you're going to say something valid. And someone's going to be like, yeah, but there's this thing over here that's in one corner of their philosophy that I really object to. And what are you going to do? Not allow yourself the permission to learn something valuable. And so in, in, in the liberty space, I credit mostly non-libertarians for helping me think clearly about liberty. I found out about libertarian thinkers. I found out about free market economists much later on in life. But the people that set the stage for that and the people that allow me to get value out of that kind of stuff are really people that don't come from that world. They don't come from those spaces. And so I don't say this merely as a matter of diplomacy and political correctness and open-mindedness, but just in terms of personal experience, my greatest teachers, the people that have educated me and given me life-changing insights have been people that others told me, well, don't listen to that person because, you know, they, they believe a different religion or don't just don't listen to that person because they're an anti-capitalist or don't listen to that person because they're this or that. And I've just never taken those things into account when I'm seeking after knowledge and education. Like, let's discriminate between truth and falsehood and, 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 and let's not let's not deify the source or deify the source in our quest for truth. I also wanted to to bring up the point that I think we're the way that we're kind of introducing this is is really trying um, is, is suggesting that we are trying to get people to open their minds up and to, you know, interact with ideas that are different than them. And I think that is important and that is true. But the same can be true that it is important for somebody who finds ideas that resonate with them and they just attach onto them without knowing uh, the true and full context of the idea. You use the analogy of socialism and how it sounds good. Uh, you, the, the analogy of uh, communism and how it sounds good, that the root of each of those words has to do with people. And I think a lot of times, you know, people just attach on to what what they feel about a certain idea without really doing a deep historical dive. And one of the things that I think is important, if you want to be a person who is respected, if you want to be a person uh, who is trustworthy, um, if you want to be a person who, you know, is thought of as a deep thinker and doesn't just follow what you're told or doesn't just follow uh, the narrative that you're pushed, but you can actually think critically for yourself I think having a healthy sense of objectivism is so important to any of these conversations, to any of these figures, to anything that you were taught growing up. It, it is important for you to maintain a level of ob objectivity where you're not 100% endorsing an idea or 100% um, you know, trying to dismiss an idea because what you've been told it's it's important to do your own research uh and 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 to understand the full picture do i mean i think you know as intellectual thinkers as people uh who want to spread messages it is our responsibility to 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 really do deep dives into things before coming and endorsing them if you're in the business of trying to sell other people on an idea it is it is just in, it is critical that you understand what the heck you're talking about and you you try to get the full context 
uh, for your conversation. So just as you know, we are encouraging people here to uh, keep an open mind to to things that they have that may have um, that they've may may have been taught, and you know that what we're bringing to the table is at odds. I would I would also suggest to the people who have interacted with these ideas and who fully support them or, or certain figures that just because, you know, you were told that these were good people, that you, you, sh- you should really um, be objective about that and, and really look at their entire body of work and evaluate them based off of that, not just of a feeling you get when you hear this person's name or you see this person's face. You know, this is why I think it's so important to identify with being a seeker of truth first and a member of any group second, if at all. It makes me think about, I was on an episode of The Minimalist and I have I have this Obama impression that I've been working on. And at one point <laughs> during the episode, I, I did my Obama impression to, uh, to um, you know, answer a question. And we were all laughing about it. And there was someone in the comments that got really bent out of shape and, and they were so upset with me because I dare to mention the name of Barack Obama and because I dare to impersonate him. And I guess by giving an answer that they agreed with, an answer that they liked in the voice of Obama, it was really bothersome. And it made me laugh because it's a classic example of how when you identify as a member of a group first rather than a seeker of truth, you always have trouble acknowledging beauty and and brilliance or value wherever it's seen because you feel like if I say yes to that specific proposition or suggestion or strategy, then it commits me to a whole bunch of other stuff about this person that I don't like. And so if someone quotes Stephen King and you got a problem with Stephen King, you can't learn anything. If somebody quotes Barack yeah. Obama and you got a problem with him, you can't learn anything. Somebody quotes a liberal and you're a conservative, a conservative or you're a liberal. And that just makes life so complicated because you're always managing everything you say based on how you think your constituents are going to respond. And the, the the lack of authenticity, the lack of courage, the lack of, uh, of, of conviction, it, it just will drown out the value of anything else that you say, you know. So speaking of meaning and optics, though, man, I, I want to talk just briefly about the meaning and optics of revolution, because we, we call this show the revolution of one. And um, the, uh, there's there's a reason why I chose this word. And I know the term revolution has a set connotation. And, and I, I want to read here the definition of the word revolution. And the term revolution means in political science, a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power and political organization, which occurs when the population revolts against the government, typically due to perceived oppression or political incompetence. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a change in the way a country is governed, usually to a different political system, and often using violence or war. When you use that word revolution or the word revolutionary, people tend to think, oh, this is referring to a, a violent overthrow of the existing system. And whether you think that's good or bad usually depends on what you think of the existing system. The reason I call this brand the revolution of one is because like we discussed in the uh, inquiry into to mass movements, Whenever there is a rebellion, a revolt, a revolution of any kind, there are always legitimate concerns, fears, and grievances. And if you ever want to address fears, concerns, and grievances, you have to begin with acknowledging where those things are valid. You can't begin by critiquing people's method for finding relief. You begin by acknowledging what is valid about what people feel. And then when you acknowledge what is valid about people's feelings and concerns, you try to find the best system and strategy for resolving those feelings and concerns. The word revolution, its traditional connotation is one that defines government as the enemy and violence as the solution. At least that's the way it's often depicted. For me, revolution of one is about defining violence as the enemy and creative action as the solution. Things like entrepreneurship, art, creative activism, 
grassroots collaboration, the things that we can do to make our individual lives better and the things that we can collaborate and do with others who have skin in the game to make our communities better. And so for me, the revolution of one isn't about saying, hey, let's go do something violent to overthrow the existing government because it begins with the assumption that violence itself is the root and cause of all evil. The desire to enslave others, the desire to oppress others, the desire to artificially restrict people's natural capacity to create, the desire to, the desire to tramp on individual rights, that is the enemy. And the only way that we overcome that enemy is by getting creative because anyone that is rooted in violence is limited to strategies of coercion. And so the best mm. way to beat coercion is through creativity. And so that's what the revolution of one is all about. And, and so that, that segues me into the conversation we had about Malcolm X. And I wanna use that as a segue into a second part where we go into the Black Panthers. That'll be the first revolutionary group that we'll cover We'll talk about who they are. We'll talk about what their aims were. We'll talk about what went wrong and what are some things that we can learn from the Panthers. The reason I set it up with Malcolm X is because, to quote a Black Panther himself, if they wouldn't have assassinated Malcolm X, there would have been no Black Panthers in the first place. In many ways, the Black Panthers was an effort to instantiate you know, what I call uh, Malcolm X's three pillars of, of individualism or three pillars of individual liberty. So I want to talk a little bit about Malcolm X's three pillars of individualism, because I think these are really awesome, powerful insights. And we'll use that as a segue into part two to talk about the Panthers and the efforts they made to actually live that out. So let's go with pillar number one. And I have a quote for each of these. I'll articulate the pillar in my own words in one sentence, and then I'll, I'll read the quote here. Pillar number one individual responsibility for self-sufficiency. Here are the words of Malcolm. Our problems will never be solved by the white man. The only way that our problem will be solved is when the black man wakes up, cleans himself up, stands on his own feet, and stop begging the white man and take immediate steps to do for ourselves the things that we have been waiting on the white man to do for us. Once we do for self, then we will be able to solve our own problems. I do not want to meet the white person that would have a problem with those words because I couldn't imagine how much you hate individual rights and the success of all people if you got a problem with those words. For a man that has often been depicted as being arbitrarily separatist, as being hateful of others, I find this quote really captures the essence of his philosophy. For Malcolm X, it wasn't about saying, no, you can't help me, or no, I don't want you working with me, or no, I don't want you to be friends with me. For Malcolm X, it was about saying, if we don't learn how to respect ourselves, how to love ourselves, how to help ourselves, and how to connect and collaborate with each other, then the problems that we already have will only be amplified if we bring other people into our communities when we don't even know how to get along with each other. And so for Malcolm, it was about self-sufficiency. Malcolm did not preach a philosophy of sitting back, waiting for politicians or anyone to say, hey, we hear you, we believe you, we care, we're gonna heal your land. For Malcolm X, it was like, hey, let's figure out what we can do for ourselves. Not because there's no one out there who owes us anything, but rather because we would be the fool to sit around waiting on people to make good on what we think they owe us because no one's gonna care about our dreams and our freedom like we can, like we will. Yeah, you, you hear this kind of talk in, in a lot of people's frustration. I think, you know, just speaking politically, a lot of people um, who associate with values that are more conservative or uh, more right wing uh, tend to talk about, you know, responsibility um, and, you know, not relying on uh, any kind of handouts. And then and then people on the left, I think uh, a lot of the conversations you hear who people who associate with being really liberal or progressive um, or just, you know, on the left, uh, 
tend to uh, want to have conversations about how um, the pe- the people at power, you know, whether those are governments or politicians or you know systems, need to l- collectively help out everybody, and how you know the people at the bottom need to be prioritized, and you know j- it's more of a you owe us help kind of conversation that happens and that uh, don't get too carried away with your power, et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of uh, conversations that that I've heard growing up from both sides. And and it's really interesting because I think there's a lot of people who I think from both sides get frustrated with comments like these um, because I think people, you know, from the right want to look at people from the who have a mentality that is uh, I need help and and there's a certain lack of just understanding like wh- like what the heck is wrong with you why can't you just pick yourself up by your own bootstraps why can't you just go out and do the thing why can't you just you know why can't you just why can't you just why can't you just and there's a lot of anger uh, behind that and 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 to that like I understand I understand the frustration. Um, and I was actually, the reason I even bring this up, because I was having a, a conversation a couple days ago with a buddy of mine uh, who, who tends to have more values that are conservative. And, and I think people like Malcolm X probably wouldn't identify with being conservative or would identify with being um, liberal. I think he was really an independent thinker in the way that he approached politics and the way that he approached uh, building community. And I think there's a certain level of responsibility um, that that I 1000% agree with that I think the the way to liberation um, is for people to believe in themselves first, not to not to expect that any saviors or that anybody owes them, you know, a, a, a way out of their current situation. I think that true power is really internalized before it's externalized. And that a lot of times people, whether it's they've been trained to think this way or um, they just don't have the knowledge or they're not confident, there, there's a lot of deterrence that that don't really empower people that, that don't really teach people that, you know, you have so much potential. Like it, 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 it's, it might be dormant right now, but you have the seeds that you need to make stuff happen. You, you know, you, you have it. And it's important to, to kind of start with the mindset um, of, of individuality first and, and, and really learning how, uh, to grow and and to mobilize change based off of your own actions, your own convention, convictions, your own preferences, um, and 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 your own ability. But I think what a lot of people miss that uh, you know a lot of people who preach personal responsibility and and, and who you know find themselves really frustrated with people who, who don't have that same mentality is, is there's a lack of empathy. There's a lack of love. There's lack of compassion. And it's one thing to be able to say, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? You know, what is wrong with you uh, versus teaching people and showing people and empowering people to make that happen. I think it's important to acknowledge that there's a lot of systems at play, especially politics um, that don't really help or empower people to think individually, to think for themselves, which is what our platform is all about. It's, it's really about empowering individuals uh, to realize their potential. And to ignore the fact that there are systems at play that are deterring people from thinking like that, that are deterring people uh, from from leaning into their individuality. Uh, I because I think the, the reason because of that is because you know, they want you to join their groups. They want you to feel the agendas. That's what we kind of talked about with radical mass movements on that episode. You know, the, the the easiest targeted people to be looped into certain agendas of groups and of political parties and of, you know, movements, radical mass movements are people who are frustrated with the current status quo, who are frustrated with their life, who are frustrated uh, because they're not, you know, 
they're not being able to to move in ways that are conducive to the dreams and, and, and helping them progress. And so I think you have to acknowledge that people have the potential and I think a better angle uh, in order to get people to take more responsibility in, it, in order to get people uh, to really live up to their potential and, and to be self-sufficient people is, is through empowering messages. And I think that's uh, was a lot of times that was Malcolm X's approach, given it was on, you know, the rougher and not softer side and un, an unapologetic side of things. But it was very much about, you know, we need to take this action first. You know, we cannot wait for handouts. We cannot uh, be a dormant people that, you know, we have everything that we need. You know, there there is no, um, there is no advantage that, you know, a white person intellectually has over you as black folks. And I think helping empower people is going to be so is going to be so much more effective and, and is going to have so much more impact on people's ability to think that way um, than to, to continuously question and bash people. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Yeah, man, that is so well said. And I, I think everything you said highlights why I like Malcolm's articulation, articulation of personal responsibility more than what I typically hear from conservatives and libertarians who talk about this idea. For me, personal responsibility is not the same as the denial of personal difficulty. A lot of people who advocate for personal responsibility, they use phrases like, hey, no one's out to get you. And I'm not so comfortable with that because I think an important part of being empowered and intelligent and strategic is also refusing to be naive about the realities of the yes. world. And the fact of the matter is, there are some very evil people who do very wicked things. There are manipulative people. There are corrupt people. There are people who will throw you under the bus, who will stab you in the back in order to get ahead in life. And there are many people, some of whom I unfortunately know personally, who have lost their very lives at the hands of those kinds of individuals. And one of the most dangerous things we can do is subscribe to a philosophy that tells us to underestimate or disregard the possibility that there may be multiple people out there who are out to get us. I'm not here to tell people there's no one out to get you. I'm here to tell people that there might actually be more people out to get you than you think, but you have to take ownership of the process of learning how to defend yourself, how to protect yourself, how to provide for yourself how to navigate the complexity of social life, how to be able to read people so that when someone is out to get you, you know how to either get out of the way or you know how to limit or minimize the way in which their behavior will affect you. And so sometimes that conversation between the person who says, well, I'm struggling with this or they're doing this to me and the other person that says, stop blaming other people for your problems, you need to take responsibility that message sounds like it's telling people you can never, ever suggest that you are going through difficulty because of what someone else did to you. And our intuition is going to let us know that that's false because every day we have yes. evidence of dealing with challenges that are the direct result of how other people's behavior affects us. Personal responsibility cannot be the denial of that. It's got to be an empowering message about how we don't have to let what other people do to us be the final word on on our destiny, on who we will, who will, who we way will become. Way yeah, yeah. Let's go to this uh, second pillar of Brother Malcolm, where he talks about uh, the second pillar is, is individual responsibility for self-education. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Mm. And I love how he left this sufficiently open so that it becomes a timeless insight that applies to 30 years ago, 30 years from now, and today. Because he doesn't tell you who the oppressors are in that statement. He just lets you know that if you are the kind of person who accepts <laughs> uncritically whatever mainstream media is telling you to be true, 
you're probably going to have some skewed, distorted perceptions of reality. And so you've got to take charge of your own education. And one of the things that Malcolm preached a lot is that if we want to improve our lot, we not only can't afford to wait on politicians to save us, but we also can't wait on politicians to educate us. We have to be the ones who take responsibility for knowing our history, for knowing our value. We have to teach our children. We have to teach our families how to respect themselves, how to love themselves, how to achieve their potential and so on. And people who spent time around him understood him to be, he was a very stern man, but he had a really soft heart for people's potential. In fact, one of my favorite depictions of him is in the is in the movie, Spike Lee's movie. And you see a young man who, who comes to Malcolm and, and Malcolm is there with the other brothers and he asks him, how can he become a Muslim? And Malcolm just challenges him, you know, like, have you studied it? Have you looked into it? Like, and the guy's like, no, you know, and he's like, well, you shouldn't become something just because, you know, it was something that you haven't researched or haven't even thought about. And, and you can tell that the guy's a little ashamed of himself and he's embarrassed and he begins to walk away and Malcolm calls him back. But you also shouldn't run away from something that you're interested in just because somebody challenges you in the way that I did. Like the way to respond to my challenges, young man, to paraphrase, isn't to hang your head low and be ashamed. It's to rise to the occasion of your potential. And whenever he worked with young brothers, he always made that effort to pull them up. Um, and so anybody that wants to spread a message of personal responsibility, because I believe we need it, we cannot, uh, we cannot have a better world or a freer society if we aren't teaching people to take personal responsibility for creating the results that matter most to them. <clears throat> but if you're gonna preach that message, you have to do it as a person that's genuinely passionate about people's potential and as a person that doesn't ask others to just um, naively accept that 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 things don't happen to them. But but I'm but I'm kind of off topic because we we're, we're talking about education, but the point is the point is we have to take responsibility for feeding our own minds and seeking our own sources of information. Yeah, and I think this particularly goes back to an important fact. You have to be a seeker of truth in order to, you know, remain a person who is committed to self-education. I think especially when it comes to society, I mean, this happens all the time. If there was a scientific discovery that happened in 1920, it is more than likely that that scientific discovery will have been rediscovered or advanced upon by 2020. That same scientific discovery is not going to stay the same for the course of 100 years. And I think that is because people who are in that certain field of discovering things about science are committed to seeking truth. They're not committed to a certain philosophy or a certain belief system uh, that represents that this one thing is the thing and that's the thing for eternity. And I think a lot of people get lost in that, that they want to believe a certain ideology because uh, somebody that they liked have preached this or, you know, a party that they're a part of or a group that they identify with um, have have said this message and they allow that loyalty to cloud their judgment of continuously searching for the truth, that the truth, uh, you know, evolves as it should. As, as you grow as a person, uh, that that truth should evolve for you. I, I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that that truth is no longer true for somebody else or other people. But if you're a person who's committed uh, to realizing your potential, committed to your own evolution, then your inner truth is going to evolve and you need to surround yourselves and consume other forms of education that also evolve, that are not just preaching the same tone deaf messages, that that there are sources of information that that are also committed to seeking the truth. But there, there are also sources of information that are not committed to seeking the truth, that are committed to uh, control and that are con that are using misinformation uh, intention, intentionally and, 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 and maliciously. And I think if you're somebody who 
I think one is listening to this conversation, then you're probably not somebody who is limited to only participating and engaging with conversations that are happening in the mainstream. But if if you are somebody uh, or come from a family of people or a community of people, it's more than likely that a lot of the people that we're talking about, like Malcolm X, you know, like Huey P. Newton, like people uh, that have these really negative perceptions around them. You've probably never heard of anything about them, especially anything good about them at that. You've only heard negative things. But if if you're somebody who's committed to, to, to learning about truth, then you put yourself in a position where you can go past some of the rhetoric, past some of the propaganda, past some of the, the bad narratives about individual people and you can go past that into the point where you're interacting with their ideas and the things that they stood for. And you can take seeds of that and help inform your own truth and help inform your own world belief. But if you're if you're only caught up in what people are saying about somebody else, what the narrative, um, what popular opinion is, if, if you're not OK with stepping outside of that and and being a person who is committed to uh, finding the most accurate version of truth and and really committed to your own self education, then you're gonna miss an entire uh, world of ideas that that could really change you and could really help you evolve because you you can't see past the lens of you know this particular ideation or this particular philosophy or this particular group identity. It's so important to, to, to be able to stand alone, to be able to be in opposition with popular opinion um, and to find truth in whatever form or fashion that comes in. Yeah, man, I, I think I think that the author of this quote is G.K. Chesterton. I hope I'm getting this right. But the quote is, the truth is so valuable that it's often surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. If you don't practice what you just talked about, looking beyond the optics, looking beyond the brand of a person and and focusing on the substance of what's being said, if we can take the Martin Luther King quote about not judging people by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, we can also extend that and say, don't judge people by the, um, the reputation of their brand, but rather by the substance of their arguments, by the substance of their ideas. But um, so, so one example of this, Take Jesus. When 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 Pilate was was trying to make a decision about Jesus, he could find no wrong. It's like he hasn't done anything wrong. This is a weird situation to put me in. And so he tries to get out of it. He tries to get out of it by presenting the people with a choice and saying, I'm going to release to you one prisoner and you get to choose. I'm going to give you Barabbas. This guy that we all know is really evil. I'm going to pick somebody that's really evil. And I know the people won't pick him. Or you can take Jesus, and this is his way of like trying to get out of it because he can't find anything guilty on him. The people look at the options before them. They say, give us Barabbas, you know, give us Barabbas. And I think that refrain is something that gets said in every generation. Whenever a powerful leader comes along who preaches a truth that can liberate people and unify people, rather than accept the message, people say, give us Barabbas. And they say, give us Barabbas in a lot of different ways. But what that fundamentally means is that people will accept demonized and distorted narratives about someone in order to not have to confront what it is they say. And they they are willing to put themselves in a situation where they can be harmed. You want Barabbas running around your people? You want Barabbas running around free? Hey man, I'll take anything other than confronting the truth and the way that the truth challenges me. And and so if you want to be someone that's free, you want to be somebody that really knows what liberty means, you've got to avoid that that tendency of people to just focus so much on everything but the substance of the arguments. You got to take charge of your own mind. I, I want to say one more other thing, because you find a lot of times, especially I'm just going to go pop culture here, that people get frustrated with some of the, the popular uh, pop stars, popular hip hop stars, popular, you know, musicians and influential, uh, you know, celebrities because 
of certain like views that they have or, or certain, um, you know, maybe ignorances that they have. And, and there's a lot of people I see it on social media all the time. They're so frustrated, like, you know, why is the media highlighting this person? Why is the media highlighting this person? Um, you know, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And I think if you're somebody who only pays attention to mainstream, who only is a part of conversations uh, that, you know, are are publicly available, that are, you know, on all the main news channels or on all, you know, the main social media, um, you know, hip hop channels, then I think you're missing out on entire bodies of work uh, that go past those basic mainstream conversations. A lot of them don't have a lot of depth. A lot of them, uh, you know, talk about things in society that are maybe raunchy, that are, uh, you know, some people might find disrespectful. Some pe people just find like, uh, low life character, you know, because those are the things that are easy to highlight, especially, you know, you hear it in rap all the time. Uh, people talk about murdering, people talk about selling drugs, people talk about pimping hoes and tricks. Um, that that's kind of easy. But there's a lot of artists out here who talk about so much more than that, and who, who really, um, who really can provide powerful messages through their art form. But a lot of people who complain about, you know, where's all the people, you know, these rap figures are, you know, not giving us good messages. They're, 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 they're ruining the community. Well, you're not looking, you're not looking beyond, um, what's being portrayed to you. And I think to the extent that you're, you're, you're able to look beyond, uh, what the mainstream conversation is, you, you, you come across just these amazing, uh, thinkers and, and artists who articulate ideas who either reaffirm things that you've already been thinking or teach you something and 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 help develop a better person like i'm a better person for engaging uh with ideas that weren't taught to me in school i'm i'm actually more of who i am now because i've dove into things that weren't really taught in the school. I, I found things that were in line with my interests. I found things that were in line with my curiosity and I engaged with that. And because of that choice of that self-education, I am closer to who I aspire to be. I'm more in line with my dreams, my hopes and potentials, not because I'm following some ideology that those people preach, but because I, I, I looked at their life, their situation and thought about how does that apply to me? You know, how can I relate to that? A lot of times people who are talked about in the mainstream, you might not be able to connect with, but there's that doesn't mean that there isn't other people out there, other figures out there, other artists out there that who've done similar things that you want to do. You don't just need to accept the people who are presented to you like it is important to look at biographies of people who are in line with what you believe they're just they just might be harder to find but if you do find them it is worth the digging because you engaging with their work is going to move you so much further along in your own development than if you just decide to play it safe and engage with popular opinion and, and what's talked about in the mainstream yeah, and isn't isn't that where all the good stuff is? I heard somebody say, if you want to think things, if you want to think like everybody else, well, consume the same content as everybody else. It's funny that you you know you brought up rap and hip hop because historically those were grassroots movements that sprung up out of a a a spirit of critical thinking, a a, a spirit of freedom. And you find a lot of the earliest rappers, and there are a lot of people like that today who might be called conscious rappers, but you got a lot of people like that today, placed a heavy emphasis on things like spirituality, on self-actualization, on asserting yourself. I think about KRS-One, aka the philosopher, who said, the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, so visualize wealth and put yourself in the picture. What was that brother talking about? Right. He, he was talking about that idea of seeing yourself in a new reality, tapping into the power of your mind, not letting who you will become be defined by who you were yesterday. I think about Smooth B and D Nice. Smooth B said, what did he say? Um, uh, Smooth B, notorious, glorious, 
My knowledge is infinite. I live in a fortress. I'm so astronomical. Yet on a spiritual plane, my body's just a shell and the yoke is my brain. I strain to gain spirituality mm -hmm. so I can finally be in unity, harmony with thee, all I seeing, the supreme being. What was this brother talking about? It's not drugs, right? But you got to go looking for it. You got to go listening for it. You cannot just limit your knowledge and understanding to what people throw in your face. And all the liberating insights, by the way, are the ones that take more than five seconds to generate. All the liberating insights are the ones that take more than just waking up in the morning and hoping that the apple of gravity hits you on the head and you come up with this revolutionary idea. I mean, this is what people get at when they talk about meditation. There's something to be said about unplugging for a little bit from what's being flooded into your your senses and, 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 and tuning in and saying, I'm gonna be patient and I'm gonna sit with an idea. I'm gonna sit with the perception. I'm gonna sit with silence and, and, and give my give my awareness over to something deeper, you know, than just the bells and whistles that are all around me. Hey man, let's do pillar three. Let's do pillar three. We still got one more. And th so the first one was the um, individual responsibility for self-sufficiency. The second was individual responsibility for self-education. And the third is individual right to self-defense. This was that by any means necessary brother right here. He says, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send him to the cemetery. It's funny because I can see, uh, I'm speculating here, but I can see Malcolm starting with that last sentence. If someone puts his hand on you, send him to the cemetery. I think he probably would have been fine with that one. But he's such a great communicator and such and he and he possesses such sensitive social awareness that he already knew that the world wouldn't let him get away with making that statement, that the world would distract itself by accusing him of preaching something other than what he really believed. And so he started off. The first thing he says is be peaceful. <laughs> right. Next thing he says is be courteous. Then he says, obey the law. All right. I'm taking away all the excuses for how you might be you know, inclined to misinterpret this. Respect everybody. Yep. I didn't put a qualification on it and tell you what color to respect. I'm telling you to respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, and that is the source of his power, man, because that was a brother that was willing to stand up for himself and speak up for himself and encourage other people to do the same. And when And when you stand in the presence of such a person, you know you're standing in the presence of the real and you know you're standing in the presence of something that calls a part of you to be something better than what you've allowed yourself to be. I think one of the most important principles of living fully and freely at an individual level is learning how to stand up for yourself, not buying into a philosophy that says, well, I shouldn't have to ask for what I want. Well, I shouldn't have to tell somebody that there's a problem. Well, I shouldn't have to speak up and get into an argument and defend myself. Well, you probably shouldn't have to. But the problem is we didn't get the universe that we should have, right? Like we, we, we didn't get that universe. We didn't get the universe where nobody bothers you, nobody annoys you, nobody attempts to take advantage of you. We got the other universe where sin is a possibility, where evil is a possibility. And so we have to take that into account and be willing to do the work necessary to say, hey, look, whoever you are, you're going to respect me because the way that I carry myself will always signal that I'll be kind, that I'll be courteous, that I'll be good to you. But there's a line in my life that you aren't going to cross. And if you don't have that line, you better get that line. Because if you're always finding yourself in a position where you're saying yes when other people want you to say yes. You're saying no when other people want you to say no. You're saying sorry even though you haven't done anything wrong. Somebody bumps into you and you're the one that's apologizing. Somebody takes your seat on the airplane and when you let them know they're in the wrong seat, oh, I'm sorry, you're the one apologizing. You got to get rid of that. You got to get rid of that mindset. Let other people apologize to you when they screw up, but you don't apologize for other people's screw ups. You know, you hold them accountable for it and you treat yourself with some self-respect. That's the only way to get anywhere in this world. Yeah, I, I I like the the message of self respect. I think to use a dating analogy, as you often do, when you're out here looking for somebody, um, 
you know, searching for a good relationship, searching for a good partner. I think one of the most important places to start <clears throat> is is by having a self love, is having a, an an idea of your self worth. Because if you try to give yourself to somebody without really having those answers, without having thought about those things, you're gonna find yourself in positions where you feel like you're taken advantage of, um, or you feel like you know this person uh, isn't respecting you, or this person um, is is treating you bad. And I think that a lot of times is only the case because you allowed that. You put yourself in a position or you put yourself with somebody who is in accordance to your inner identity and your inner uh, perspective of your own self-worth and your own self-respect. And if that's foggy, you know, you're going to continue to run into those same relationships and you're going to continue uh, to allow people like that in your life. And so and then on the other side of that, I'll speak to because I've been on the other side where I've been in a relationship and the other person and it took time to figure this out because I found myself being accused of, well, you don't respect me. You know, you don't you don't view um, my self-worth, you know, and, and, and it's confusing because, you know, I, I know what I'm worth and I, and I know how to articulate that. Um, but if if the other person hasn't thought about that then that as as the person on the other side of that you don't really know either if how how am i supposed to know if you don't know you know what what your level of self respect is of what of how you view yourself what your own self worth is and i think t to know your self worth first is is to give the world instructions on how to interact with you but if you don't know what your self-worth is, then the world is going to treat you how the world treats you, which is however they feel like at that day. You, you have to teach people how to interact with you. How, you know, how do you receive uh, the thing that they're trying to give? And if you don't know, then you're just going to find yourself in points of frustration and, and feeling like the victim because people aren't treating you how you want to be treated. Yeah, man, that's that's a really good point. And for people that are in that position where maybe you haven't done a lot of thinking about this and you have a little trouble um, establishing boundaries, one, one, one insight I'll, I'll offer is when other people are being manipulative or disrespectful, don't depend on your ability to convince them that they are being manipulative and disrespectful. That's too indirect. First of all, most people are simply behaving in a way that works for them or in a way that they think is right. And I've seen many people try to deal with manipulation and they're completely ineffective because they're trying to get the other person to agree with them about how manipulative they are being. And if that other person doesn't see themselves as being manipulative, you won't get anywhere because you're asking them in the name of making you happy to see themselves in a self-disparaging manner. A more direct way to deal with it is to identify the behavior that is bothering you and identify what is unacceptable and address that, right? Like if, if, if there's a particular time at which you don't want to have a conversation, articulate your need to have the conversation in this particular way, rather than saying you're disrespectful for wanting to have that conversation with me at this time or in this way. Or, 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 or you're being rude for, for wanting this of me or saying this. Like, think about why that thing is bothering you. Translate that into a need and then articulate the need because it's a lot easier to get other people to agree with you when you say, hey, I need this. If, if Kamal sends me a message at the last minute, which he hasn't done, is like, hey, can you meet with me for two hours right now? I could lash out and be like, man, that's disrespectful. You don't appreciate my time to just ask me for a two hour meeting last minute. But how is that gonna make him feel? And that doesn't even bring up what I want. I actually enjoy meeting with him. All I really want is to meet in a way that doesn't freak me out, stress me out and cause me to get behind on things, right? So a more appropriate response would be like, hey, can't do that now, but here are a couple of options where I could do it. Does that work for you? Much easier to get him to agree with me on that 
than for me to get him to see himself as a complete insensitive jerk who has no respect for me just because what he's requesting or demanding in the moment doesn't work for me. So stay focused more on your needs and getting that person to cooperate with you through request rather than focusing on value judgments you're making about someone else's character and getting them to agree with you about those value judgments. Mm. Hey man, I think we have laid a good foundation to go into the next segment. I want to talk about the Black Panthers because we've covered Malcolm X and his three pillars of, of individual liberty. And when Malcolm X was assassinated, the Black Panthers were a group that rose up in the wake of his death and their whole effort was to implement these ideas in, in, in a more mobilized, structured way. And so that's what we're gonna dive into next because th this is an example of a group that they were known as revolutionaries and they talked a lot about revolution. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beauty of their, their story and their legacy. So we're gonna pause right here and, uh, and say tune in next week for the next round where we talk about the Vanguard of the Revolution part two. And if you want to get a little context, go check out the documentary on Netflix, Vanguard of the Revolution, and um, that'll kind of give you a little prep for the next discussion. In the meantime, let us know what you think in the comments. If you got any questions or feedback, also hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, share this with a family member or a friend that you think might benefit from the conversation. And we look forward to hanging out with y'all in the future. Peace.